Hello everyone and welcome to the Easter Sunday service from Sescanor and Edenderry Presbyterian Churches. Welcome to Kitchen Table Church as we gather in our homes to worship God this Easter Sunday. Just before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. And just for anyone that is tuning in for the first time to let you know that my name is Bobby and it's my privilege and my pleasure to serve here in Sescanor and Edenderry as the minister. But as I say, let's begin with the announcements and there's a few. So uh, with it being Easter week, there will be no Exodus readings put up on Monday morning. We're going to take a break from reading our way through Exodus and also from Exodus Extra, our midweek on Wednesday nights. And they will recommence from April the 12th for the Exodus readings and Wednesday the 14th for our midweek. Also to let you know uh, that I am off this coming week. So next week's services, that's on Sunday the uh, 11th, will be conducted by Graham Reid. Uh, that's at 10.30 a.m. in Eden Derry and 12 midday in Sescanor. And Graham is from the Pedigo Congregation and he's currently studying in Union College for the ministry. So could I ask you to please pray for uh, Graham as he prepares for next Sunday and also to make him welcome and to pray for him for his studies because all the students in Union at the minute are learning online. And as a result of being off, I have arranged for the Reverend Jonathan Cowan from Mount Joy and Drumliga to cover any pastoral emergency. So should you need a minister uh, during the week, please contact your elder. They have the contact numbers for Jonathan and they can get in touch with them for you. Also, just to assure you uh, and those listening online or via the telephone line that even though I'm off, there will be a service put up next Sunday. It's going to be slightly different. It will not be me and it will not be Graham and it will lead to a different way uh, of us operating as we move forward and as COVID restrictions are lifted in the future. But I'll say more about that uh, on Sunday the 18th when I return. So it's Easter Sunday. It's the Sunday we celebrate Christ rising from the grave. What a wonderful and glorious day. All thanks to our Lord for his love and his mercy and his wonderful grace. And we usually start our Easter services by saying, Christ is risen. And then you respond, he is risen indeed. And we all say together, Alleluia. So Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. And we are going to praise God together as we sing, Come People of the Risen King. to bring him praise come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children
mercy hands find the riches of His grace Over all the world His people sing Sure to show we hear them call The truth that Christ through every age Our God is all in all Rejoice, rejoice Praise God with him, and now we're going to continue to praise God with our prayers. Let us pray. Father God, we praise you today on this wonderful day, a day of faith and not of unbelief, a day of hope and not of despair, a day of love and not of self-interest. Today is a day of life, not death, and we praise you, Lord, for the life you have given to us and sustained us through. This is the day that changes everything. Everything in this life and absolutely everything in the next life. Father God, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us when we are timid, fearful, even cowardly, and how we might live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, on this great day and over the next days of Easter, may we take time to examine ourselves and honestly say how we really feel about Jesus. May we look at ourselves without rose-tinted glasses. For Lord, we like to see ourselves in the best light. May we examine ourselves soberly in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we will be found wanting. Forgive us. And Father, we will feel you. Forgive us. And Father, we will feel one another. Forgive us. Thank you, Father God, that Jesus was not found wanting and that he neither failed you nor us. Lord God, be amongst us today as we speak with you, as we praise you and read your word. May we know your peace and may our worship be worthy of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Going to turn to God's word now, and we're going to be reading from Exodus uh, chapters 25 to 28. Now, we're not going to read all of that, but that covers the building of the tent of the tabernacle. And it comes after the portion that we looked at last week about receiving God's law, the law, law of Moses. So this week, we're going to read two short passages, the beginning of the building of the tent of the tabernacle and the final instruction towards the end of chapter 28. So we're going to read Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 to 8, and then Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 and 21. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. Then let them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Then chapter 27, verses 20 and 21. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of the meeting, outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law, 
Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance amongst the Israelites for the generations to come. Amen. And we're blessed as we read God's word together. Boys and girls, I have a really cracking question for, for you today. I want to ask you, have you ever heard of a bun being banned? And if, if you have, do you know which bun was banned? I have a bun with me today. It's one I'm going to show you in a minute. And believe it or not, a Queen of England tried to ban this bun. Now, I love these buns. I particularly love them when they're toasted and they've got lots of butter on them and I have a cup of tea to wash it down. Do you know what bun I'm talking about? I'm talking about a hot cross bun. Now, believe it or not, Queen Elizabeth I, way back in 1592, tried to ban these buns. Now, she didn't ban them because she didn't like them. She tried to ban them because they were so special. And she said they could be only eaten on one day of the year. And that was Good Friday. Now, the reason these buns are special is because of what they signify. So, of course, the first thing we see when we look at a hot cross bun is the cross, which reminds us of the cross that Jesus died on. And if we were to break the bun open, the next thing we would see, of course, is the bread. And the bread reminds us that Jesus is the bread of life. And inside the bun, there's lots of sultanas and raisins, and that, that's basically dried up grapes, from which they also make wine, which reminds us of Jesus' blood. And although you can't smell it uh, at the minute, uh, unless you get really close to it, when you put your nose to it, you can smell the cinnamon and the spices that they put into the bread. And of course, that reminds us of the spices that the ladies took to rub into Jesus's body on that Sunday morning, that Easter Sunday morning, as he was supposed to be in the grave. And lastly, the buns were made in a sort of a round shape to remind us of the stone that was rolled away by the angels and so that Jesus could come out of the tomb. And that's why the hot cross bun was so special, because it reminds us so much of God's love. And that's why you get them at Easter. I know you can get them all the year round now, but it used to be that you could only get these at Easter. The bun that was banned, except for Good Friday, the hot cross bun. So every time you look at a hot cross bun now, you will be able to say why it was so special that the Queen of England tried to ban it, except for one day. We're going to sing your song, Great Big God. Let's praise God together. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. He's higher than a skyscraper. He's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and beyond my wildest dreams. And He's known me and He's loved me. Since before the world began How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God And He holds us in His hand Our God is a great big God our God is a great big God Our God is a great big God And He holds us in His hands He's higher than a skyscraper He's deeper than a submarine He's wider than the universe And beyond my wildest dreams And He's known me and He's loved me Since before the world began how wonderful to be a part 
of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. 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 Turning to the New Testament now, we're going to read one of the passages together that I think is one of my favourites. It's from the Gospel of John, and we're going to be reading from John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. Let's hear the words of God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. We're going to praise God again as we sing, All Heaven Declares the Glory of the Risen Lord. The glory of the risen Lord Who can compare With the beauty of the Lord Forever He will be The Lamb upon the throne Gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord who once was slain. Reconcile man to God Forever you will be The Lamb upon the throne I gladly bow the knee few moments we're going to come to study the chapters 25 to 27 of Exodus all about this strange tent called the tabernacle but more importantly how it points us towards home but for but, but before we do so let's take a moment in prayer as we ask for God's guidance as we study his word let's pray Lord God as we turn to study your word we declare that we want to know your presence not that it is needed Lord but we humbly invite you into our sanctuary. May the light that shines and illuminates these words, may it be your light. And may that light shine in our hearts that we would walk in your ways and bring you glory through Jesus Christ, 
your son. Amen. Home. Home is one of those words that conjures up certain thoughts, does it not? Smells, sounds, memories, all associated with that special place we call home. Even a sight of the word home, well, that mysteriously can conjure up all those memories, all those thoughts, just at the mere sight of that word. And of course, holidays like Christmas and Easter, when for many of our young adults, they will be returning from study and work across the water to spend a few precious days at home. Well, that just cements that feeling of how special home is. And as they journey home, they too, well, they will expect smells and sounds and things that they have memorized to still be there when they, that had been there when they left. Go into one of their rooms when they are away and redecorate it to see a disappointed face as they return home because the new paint masks those old familiar smells. The change of colour will have changed the light in their room and their things, well, their old things, they, they now seem out of place with the new furniture. I know there are exceptions to the rule, but homes are and can be special places. I think the pandemic has shown us that. As for many of us, we have also turned our homes into fortresses, pulling up the drawbridge as we wait this storm out. Actually, and strangely, one of the ways people can be subdivided is in their attitude towards home. Let me ask you, are you a wanderer or are you a nester? A wanderer is someone who is always looking for a new thing or place. Someone who, before they even sit down in one place, is trying to see over the next hill, around the next corner. They are always on the move, restless, unsettled, always looking for new things to try and places to go. And Esther, on the other hand, well, that is someone who is content at home. They might be into DIY or, or interior design or simply becking. They are content to curl up on the settee in front of the TV and fire. And that is as far as they need to go. Or maybe you're a bit like me, a bit of both, happy to go on an adventure, happy to get home. The wanderer and the nester sound very different, do they not? And yet at the root of their effort is the same desire. They just take different roads to try and find it. Both want the perfect place. The wanderer tries to find it and his soul is unsettled and has to keep moving. The nester tries to create it and has to work just as hard to see what the new trend is, the new device for the home, just as much as the wanderer tries to see around the next bend. There is in all humans a sense of dislocation, a sense of homelessness, a sense of just around the next bend, or if I, if I just added that thing to my already perfect home, then I'd have made it. Maybe this desire, friends, comes for, uh, to us from the fact that we were cast out of our first perfect home. You see, God had placed Adam and Eve in the garden in paradise, along with the tree of life and lots of other trees and plants to provide food. And there they walked, talked and ate with God. God was present with them. But then when Adam and Eve messed up, they were cast out of the garden to the east, to the land of Nod, east of Eden. And this transgression was compounded by Cain when he killed his brother and he was made to wander even further away. Some of us feel this dislocation very keenly at times. You just have to visit a home where there is sickness or bereavement to feel the sense of disconnect. Home is just not home anymore. And the longing for home is increased. Exodus 25 to 27 is all about this strange tent called the tabernacle. Without being flippant about it, it literally is a tent, but a very special tent laid out in a certain way with a, a huge big windbreak around it and an entrance in one end. The people of Israel, well, they're on their journey to the promised land, but they're not there yet. So God tells them to build the tent of the tabernacle to his plan, and that's important it's to his plan. What God says is exactly like the pattern I will show you to address those issues of dislocation, to address that feeling of homelessness. Although the tabernacle is a tent, it's also a, a map showing us today the way back home. And strangely, the plans for this are in how God designed it. 
And everything from the materials used to how it was planned out, even how it was set up in a certain way, all point to this map and how it will show us the way home. And as we meet on this Easter Sunday, we see this. Even though these three chapters, we maybe brush over them uh, as a section, we think, well, not much interest, uh, in, in, interesting in that. It's just about how to build a tent. But these three chapters point directly to Jesus and specifically to Easter. So let me take a few moments to describe this strange tent that points home. And then we shall see how Easter is the fulfilment of it and also the end of it. It's the end of the tabernacle because after that first Easter, there is no more need of it. But the passage is still very important because of who it signposts on our roadmap home. As you read these chapters, they will seem mixed up. We all know that when you are camping, the first thing to get sorted is the shelter. But here, and remember, we are following God's plan. The first thing to get sorted is what is going into the tent. But that in itself shows the importance God places on our relationship with him. So the first thing to be sorted is the Ark of the Covenant, the box that the law written by God's own hand on stone will be placed in. The Ark of the Covenant becomes God's foot still, if you like, the place where God touches the earth. The people would have understood this right away because in these times, when you entered into an agreement with someone, that agreement was copied for each party, you know, a bit like a contract, and the person in charge, the person with all the power, placed it in his footstool when meeting the other party. This was the terms of their relationship. So God was laying down the house rules. This was a home where we would live under God's reign. Then they make the table and the lamp standard. Well, that's easy. The, the tent was going to a place where they would eat with God, just like the Garden of Eden with its plants and trees for food. Who you allow into your home can vary, but it will only be those you care about, you love, that you will eat with. So on this table, 12 loaves of bread, one for each tribe of Israel, were to be kept permanently, because as he has shown the people with manna, God will provide for and protect those that walk with him. Then there was the lamp standard, which as you read its description, you, you can't help but see the, resembles, the resemblance to the tree of life. This is going to be a welcoming home of food for life and light to live by. And if these signposts, how, uh, if these are signposts, how do they show us the way home? Well, John says in John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his home amongst us. The actual Greek for this literally says that the word pitched his tent among us. Jesus is our home and Jesus is our way home. Jesus tabernacled among us. Jesus became the point where heaven and earth touched. Jesus is the true ark. He is the person where we live under the reign of God. He is the king through who God reigns, through whom God reigns. Jesus is the true bread. He is the bread through whom we eat in the presence of God. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. And Jesus is the true lamp. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Our longing for home is met in Jesus. The longing that makes you go over the next hill is a longing for Jesus. The need to create a perfect home can only be met and created through Jesus. Augustine of Hippo, great name, but Augustine of Hippo, one of the early church fathers, once said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, Jesus. The next thing to be built was the tent itself. Again, the instructions are, are laid with pointers to the work of the Passover lamb and Jesus. But as we read chapter 26, which is all about building the tent, we suddenly come to a set of instructions that seem to throw a, a spanner totally into the works as the tabernacle pointing the way home to God. It says in, cha in verses 31 to 33, make a curtain of blue, purple and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen with cherubim wo woven into it by a skilled worker. Hang it 
with gold hooks and four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps and place the Ark of the Covenant behind the curtain. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. All of a sudden, friends, there is a blockage. A curtain cutting off the place where God touches the earth. A curtain with pictures of cherubim on it. The guard's place to stop mankind returning to the Garden of Eden. We tend to think of cherub cherubim as chubby babies with wings. But in the Bible, they're actually fierce creatures with four heads. A human head, a, 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 the head of a bull, a lion's head and an eagle's head. They were not, they were definitely not to be messed with. So the tent was divided into two. The Holy of Holies where the ark was and where God touched the earth and the holy place where the lamp and the table was where people could come to eat. Outside the tent was the courtyard. This big area enclosed by a curtain with gates to the east. And, and between the gates to the east, which was the only entry point, and the tent of the tabernacle was the bronze altar. This was where the people came when they made a sacrifice for their sin, where the animals would be killed and burnt, but the people got no further. And it was built to be used over and over again. There would have to be thousands, hundreds of thousands of sacrifices. The sacrifices themselves are pointers, signposts to God's solution for sin, but they are not the solution itself. On the night before Jesus died, he was talking to his disciples. They knew something was wrong. Jesus had been talking of his death and the atmosphere in the city of Jerusalem had changed. They were confused as he told them that in his father's house there was many rooms and he was going ahead of them to prepare a place and then he would come back and take them with him. The disciples didn't understand. Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? And Jesus replied, I am the way. You see, Jesus was the way because Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice. The sacrifice to end all the sacrifices that had gone on for hundreds of years. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins and bore the punishment we deserve. Jesus prepared a place for us in God's home by dying in our place. But the tabernacle tells us that it was an incomplete home because it was split. You could, still couldn't reach God, almost, but not quite because of that curtain. But Matthew tells us, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The blockage to enter into God's holy place was clear. The home was complete. Easter had done its job. As we finish, let me go back to the tabernacle. Where do we stand in relation to all this? Where is mankind? Well, we are actually outside the courtyard. We are, in effect, still in the wilderness, in the land of the Nod. We are still east of Eden. But the gates of the home face east. That's why I was so emphasising of east. The gates of the home face east where we are. They open up to the east in a permanent invitation to come in and have fellowship with God. God wants us to find our way home. He wants us to come back. And as the gates open up, the first thing we see, of course, is the altar of sacrifice, which is no longer hot. It doesn't need to be on fire anymore. It's cold because it hasn't been lit for 2,000 years and it has been replaced by a cross. And as we look further in, well, we can look right in towards the tabernacle now and there's a light on. Do you remember that last wee bit of the instructions we read was that God directed that the lamp was to be kept burning all night? Well, that what home doesn't have a light on as it waits for its loved ones to return home? And when you drive home after a hard day, you've got to admit there's nothing nicer than turning into your drive or your yard and seeing the lights on in your home. God wanted them to know where their home was and that there is someone waiting there for you. Friends, if you are far away from God, then come home today. The light is on. 
God is at home. He has pitched his tent among us through Jesus. There is bread on the table and light to see him by. There is a song. Uh, it's not a Christian song. It's by an artist called Tom Walker called I Leave a Light On. He wrote it uh, towards a friend who was lost due to his drug addiction and about how he'd always be there for him. These are some of the words. If you look into this distance, there's a house upon the hill, guiding like a lighthouse to a place where you'll be safe to feel our grace because we've all made mistakes. If you have lost your way, I will leave a light on. And if you feel far away from home and you have given yourself to Jesus, remember he died and rose again to show you the way home. Don't allow your feelings to shout louder than God's welcome home message. We need to remember the tabernacle because it points to our true home. It reminds us of the great privilege of being able to come into the presence of God. The light is on. The table is set. Let's go home and enjoy our heavenly family. Amen. As we think about what we've just heard, let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for Easter. We are awestruck by your love for us. And as we listen to your word, we realize that it is you who has created a way for us to return home through Jesus Christ. Not only did you create the way back to you, but you sent Jesus to pay the full price for us to receive a free ticket. Father, we are so unworthy. And yet it was your intention all the time to rescue us. As we are told, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Father, as Easter opens up the way home, may we be led home by Jesus. May we find our way through him that knew no sin to that place where he waits for us and where he, the King, welcomes us as a brother and a friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to bring our service to a close now as we sing together how deep the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The father turns his face away As wounds which mother chose sons to glory
resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know As we finish, I'm just left to wish you all a very, very happy Easter. Please, if you're off, enjoy it, but remember to observe the COVID rules, but to get out and enjoy the beautiful weather we've been having. And also to remind you that if you need to speak to anyone, contact your elders. But also, if you feel the need, the leading to speak to a neighbour or a friend or someone from our church family, please make sure you lift the phone and ring them because they might just be waiting for a call from you. So as we close, we will close by how we started. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.